In this video, I want to talk about the illusion of so-called uninformative priors. And so by the end of this video, I hope to convince you that although a prior may appear uninformative in one frame of reference, in another frame of reference, it's very much informative. And the example that I'm going to use to talk about this issue is that of just flipping a coin. And the idea is that we're going to specify a probability of the coin landing heads up by some parameter theta. And we're going to imagine that we are entirely unsure about the value of theta. So between its range 0 and 1, we do not have a prejudice towards any particular value. In other words, we're just going to ascribe a flat prior. So this vertical axis here is just p of theta and it's at 1. So the idea is that because the probability density is constant over this range, we are saying that we're completely ambivalent between any values of theta that lie within this range. And by saying that we're completely ambivalent in terms of values of theta, that means that we are ambivalent as to the probability of obtaining a single heads on our single coin flip. But what about instead if we consider the example of two coin flips with the same coin? And the idea here is that we could work out the probability of obtaining heads on the first throw and then heads on the second throw. And that would just be equal to theta squared if we assume independence between the throws of the coin. Do we think that seeing as we've got a uniform prior for theta, that will translate into a uniform prior for theta squared, the probability of obtaining two heads. To try and answer this question, first of all, I want to draw a graph of theta squared on the horizontal axis versus theta on the vertical axis. And I know that this is typically the sort of different way around to what we're used to, but you can sort of look at it at 90 degrees and hopefully it will, it will make sense. And it's just a kind of parabola. So it's going to look something like this orange line, which I'm drawing. And theta squared is also bounded between 0 and 1. And so we have a curve that looks something like this. And now I just want to consider theta squared being equal to a half. And we can go up to our curve, which will tell us the value of theta that will give us theta squared being equal to a half which of course is just 1 over root 2, the square root of a half, which is approximately something like 0 0.7 or 0.71. So why have I done this? Well, the idea is that because of the monotonicity of our curve here, in other words, it's always increasing, the theta squared values between 0 and a half correspond to the theta values between 0 and 0 0.7. So we've only gone about half of our range in theta squared, but we've gone almost three quarters of our range in terms of theta. So what does that mean? It means that essentially the probability mass is going to be squashed for theta squared relative to that of theta, and it's going to be squashed to the left. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can mark off on our original diagram here, the sort of 0.7 mark, and we can see that the probability mass corresponding to theta being less than 0.7 but greater than zero corresponds to this shaded area which I've drawn here. So this range in terms of theta corresponds to this probability mass here. And we know because of the fact that we've got a uniform prior that this area is approximately equal to 0 0.7 or 0 0.71. So what does that tell us? It tells us that between 0 and a half for theta squared, the area under that curve, whatever the probability distribution is for theta squared, must be the same, it's roughly 0 0.7, which means that the remaining area between a half and theta squared is equal to one only corresponds to something like 0 0.3. So how can we actually generate a probability density that represents these kind of ratios of area? Well, on the bottom axis here, I'm just gonna have some parameter phi, which I'm gonna define as being equal to theta squared, and on the vertical axis, we've got p of phi now, but just remember whenever you see phi, I'm just meaning theta squared. And now if we consider the values between zero and one, we kind of see that the curve must be sloping downwards. 
so that when we get to theta squared is equal to a half, which is somewhere like that, the area under the curve up to that value of a half must correspond to about 0 0.7, and the remaining area must correspond to roughly 0 0.3. So this area here is 0 0.3, and this area here is 0 0.7. So you can see that the probability mass from our prior distribution for theta has essentially been moved to the left. It's kind of all been moved leftwards. And that's mean that we've got a corresponding rise in the probability density here and a corresponding fall in probability density where theta is close to one. So this curve, which I've drawn here, sort of qualitatively at least represents the density that we're going to obtain for theta squared. So for clarity, this is the density that results for theta squared if we assume a uniform prior for theta. Another way to think about this kind of leftward shift is because in the range of zero to one, theta squared is always less than or equal to theta. And because it's always less than or equal to theta, essentially that means that we need to shift our probability mass to the left. Okay, now that I've sort of hand-wavingly described the shape of the prior for theta squared, let's derive it using maths. And the way that I always think about these kind of transformation of variables problems is I first of all think about it in terms of integrals. So we know that the integral from zero to one of p of phi, where phi is just theta squared, integrated with respect to phi, must be equal to 1, which must in turn be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of p of theta d theta. We know that that's the case because p of phi and p of theta are both probability distributions. But we can just kind of take away the integral signs, meaning that we're just left with here p of phi d phi equals p of theta d theta, which we can just rearrange to obtain p of phi equals p of theta d theta over d phi. So this tells us exactly how we can derive our density for phi. And this sort of second term here is what's known as the Jacobian of the transformation. So how do we obtain d theta over d phi? Well, it's quite easy. We know that phi is equal to theta squared which we can rearrange to have theta equals phi to the power of half, which we can then just differentiate. So if we differentiate that, we obtain d theta over d phi equals a half phi to the minus a half. And so what we're left with is that p of phi is equal to p of theta, which is just one, times d theta over d phi, which is just one over 2 times the square root of phi. And so we can see that that is actually the shape that we've drawn here. It's this kind of downward sloping curve. And so we've obtained mathematically what we obtained sort of hand-wavingly. So in summary, you can see that even though we assumed what appeared to be an uninformative prior in terms of theta, in other words, the probability of obtaining a head, when we move to a different frame of reference and we ask a, a different question about the probability of obtaining two heads, our uniform prior for theta actually made it appear that we are much more confident in not obtaining two heads. That's because our density is higher for low values of theta squared. In other words, we're ascribing a relatively low probability to the outcome of two heads occurring. And whilst I've described this problem for a simple coin flip example, this holds more generally. There is no way to create a prior which is uninformative in all frames of reference. And because of that, there isn't really a prior which you can say is entirely uninformative.